that children learn by being amongst people who practice one or the other craft from early childhood onwards and no pressure is put on them to do anything but they do it spontaneously by wanting to imitate and these children are never pressured anyway of having to achieve anything when they lose interest they may drop it but it is a succession of many years of merely going around in a village from one craftsman to another from one expert to another and watching and trying to help or trying to take part in it that that learning process goes and in a village you have so many different craftsmen of so many different kinds that the children wander from one another and get a very wide sampling of arts and crafts but never at any time that they have an obligation of any sort you see. and the strange thing is that they respond very well to it because the, the interest is sustained what you see happening is that such children are eager to do better than the next child that slightly older children are eager to teach the younger child they're very gentle and patient and they lapse from the role of pupil to teacher without any problems whatsoever no ego is involved for some strange reason they seem to adopt this no role very naturally according to what they judge themselves to be pupil to the one or teacher to the other they make that swift uh, shift very gracefully it's a role that isn't able to develop so freely in our system of putting 40 or 30 children of the same age into a particular job lot and keeping them isolated from others of varying ages well as i see it in new zealand the situation would have to be created where you have let me say anything to a dozen different craftsmen working which children may visit and uh, watch and behave as they wish and profit from it as they wish you see and the strange thing is the children respond extremely well to it particularly because there is no pressure on them whatsoever yeah. but simply gathering up information gathering up impressions and naturally trying it in themselves you see. Uh, where the slow learner and the swift or the rapid learner it makes no difference Balinese understand that some people who are slow learners may blossom into far more thorough artists sometimes the finer craftsmen simply because they're more ponderous and slow are also more intense you see so you can't tell they also have a, an implicit belief that any child is potentially an artist yes. any child the only thing is some learn quickly some learn slowly and that's the difference yes. individual difference and also a very wide sample you see and they learn in a very easy stages the most intricate and difficult things but bit by bit. That is so yeah. But the key to it is that the children have their own pace of learning. Yeah. And that is never forced in any way. Yeah. So the ideal situation, as I would see it, was in a situation where you have anything up to 20 very different craftsmen all together, accessible to children. But you can understand, <coughs> you never get government departments even taking a thing like that on. It will be a long time. 
Well, we must be government departments taking that thing on in some form or another because I think our education system is very dependent on innovative and imaginative and appropriate change to meet circumstances in our modern society. Earlier period in well, this belongs to a pre-industrial society. Of course. Yeah. So we can appreciate that there was once upon a time a very different way of teaching and a different uh, way, a place for art in society. The dance, the dance is taught in exactly the same, exactly way. same way. And you see and in Bali, you see in Bali that, that let me say, children, say form children form a dance group, a dance which, group is actually which is actually a, dance a dancing school, school. A miniature. A miniature. Mm. Or, or a club, a club for, musicians. for musicians. They teach, they one, teach another. one another. Children, Children teach, teach music, music to a slightly older, older group. group. As, As a consequence, the village is never, never stuck for musicians. musicians. If the older musicians get sick, they have always another age group on tap to fill the gap. They're never stuck. The only difference between the young musicians and the old musicians is that they have a wider repertoire than the youngsters. But as far as the competence of playing, the perfection is the same as that of the old. Mm. You see, the children only have a, no fewer pieces. But those pieces that they play is uh, to the same standard as the older thing. That's the only difference. So what is the term for the ancestor who gives the moko to the child? Makutuna Tunga, I think, the child. I don't know. Nani Moko? Don't know. I can't remember don't hearing know. of that. Can I have never that? come across any information to that effect. But that was what I was specifically talking about. I said, Moko Tunga means just that. Tunga, a wellspring, a next generation. Um, moko, the giving of the Moko. You discerned there were rules to follow in Moko. Yes. Um, and you also referred to bloopers, the no, mistakes that you Because made. in my study I had to start right from scratch. Right. Total black. Mm. And the means was copying. Copying revealed gradually that there was such a thing as a persistent order and system in things. In the linear process of Moko understanding, is there a start? You read in Moko firstly for its structure. Uh, and the next thing you learn or look for is the details, which are usually all unique to each Moko. See, so there is a general carrying structure that carries the details. It's very self contained and it refers not to nothing else but itself and its system, carefully devised by man, you know, carefully built up, as it were, formulated. And that must have been a long time in the making and perfecting it until they had it just in that complex, in that complexity of uh, structure and combination. That wasn't born in a day, that was born over generations and with some of the brightest people perfecting the system. And only an old tradition could have done that. I think the it is definitely not the, the creation of one single man, but the contributions of many men over a long period of time. Yeah. Communal. Mm -hmm. And Dave also communally understood. David Simmons the other day insisted on mentioning how um, you'd have an exceptional artist whom the others would follow. Yeah. Mm, and would start a whole stu school. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably a lot of material that was recorded with John, John and perhaps with Dave Simmons the other day relating to how to better come to terms with approaching Moko as something that can be understood as a graphic um, representation. And there are therefore other things that I'd like to ask you about. The role of the specialization of the tohunga themselves. Well, I never made a study of tohungas and tohunga-ism. 
in itself. You know, I wasn't interested in that aspect. Only where they cropped up when they functioned as artists in tattoo or as artists as carvers. I wondered from hearing that interview whether, in fact, the Tohara was somebody who exclusively did tattoo. Uh, Loco. Well, in Bali, the story is that uh, artists are by nature versatile particularly when they live in the pre-industrial world, like the Maori had. They were always versatile. They were as much musical as they uh, had the ability to be actors or the ability to be carvers or to be designers. That's right. But also, having these versatile talents they could switch to almost anything at all. But then you had also another lot of specialists, let me say, for the lashings on the canoe. They were specialists in themselves, you see. But they made a contribution to this creation like a canoe. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, carvers played their part, and where painters played their part. So never the product of one single individual. The Tohunga was relatively uh, only part of the thing. He was generally the supervisor. Most references I've come over, they have more or less been supervisors of the creative process, in which many other people took place, except as tattoo artists. They are the, the very much individuals who for their special skill and excellent were very much demand far from home. They traveled great distances and were called in by chiefs because they specially wanted to be tattooed by one special man. And there is the Tohunga who is unique and that is only in the field of Mughal or in carving. Earlier in the day, earlier in the day when you were talking to Conrad, you were talking and the carver was almost someone that did what he did um, as a part-time thing or as part of a whole. The tohunga you were suggesting was or is more involved in being a tohunga all the time. Uh, I think that almost anybody who fancied it would undertake to become a greenstone carver to make their own and to the degree of this skill, they would make a product that was from mediocre to exceptional. Mm -hmm. That followed more, more or less uh, the differences between people's talents or gifts. What you notice about that sort of thing is that it was the chiefs who carved. Mm -hmm. um, they were all expected to be able to carve. And the chief sons were expected to be able to carve. It was a right of them to use the coin and not for any colour of anything else. Mm. This is in wood, but necessar not necessarily in stone. What do you think, huh? I don't know what to say to that. set rituals which the Tohunga were supposed to perform. Would repeat it? Um, the place of set ritual. Um, was the Tohunga called upon to perform things that were regularly expected of him in the same way that perhaps a priest conducts a mass? Well, I know nothing about it because I've never made a study of Tohungas. You know. <laughs> I'm no expert on to whom. Further question, one that I actually want to ask. Neither have I been living observer of that. No. I can only deduct from what I make from analysis from actual things, you see. You, you, at one stage in that interview, referred to 
there being some real wizards amongst the Tohunga saints? Well, by the evidence of the work that they did, yes. which you can see and touch. Mm. Mm. Not by what you've been told, you don't need it at all. Just as much as you can study any kind of an achievement and make your estimate of the brilliance of the man who made it, mm. whether it's a poem or you know, a short story or whatever. The brilliance of a, of a performer comes through. <coughs> you don't need to know any, you don't need to know the living man. You don't need to know the surroundings or any story about him at all. It's as clear as a bell that he's written. All right, I know <coughs> that you've not made a special study of Tohangas. One thing you did talk about was the transfer of mana and how it ceased to occur through the splitting of the older Tohunga into the younger Tohunga's mouth. Yes. Um, and apparently at some stage that became unpopular. What I'd like to ask you was, is that a euphemism for homosexuality amongst the Tohunga? No. Um, uh, Nothing whatsoever to do with it. Yeah. It is passing something of your essence. And it was refused at to another the person. Yes. Yeah. But it is yeah. only one reference. Yeah. Is there a recording of that? A recording of one reference, somebody who was asked <coughs> why he did not become a Tohunga. And he gave that as the reason why had he did not want to become an apprentice. Do you know any of the names of these people? No, I can't tell you where I come across it, but I definitely came across that reference in some early account. You see, whether that was the rule, I don't know. But there is a hint. And that could only be a, a Maori kind of thing. No European would ever think of that one. <coughs> Getting back to the notion of the Moko artist at work being a Tohunga as well, what sort of native herbs, plants, for instance, were used in the process? Um, I don't know. Was anything done? Personally? I don't know. I, I never I made a study of that angle or that aspect of it. So I wasn't interested. To your knowledge, and as far as your studies were concerned, you were interested in the graphic result rather than the graphics. Whether they had any pure graphics well. and uh, pure tangible things, mm -hmm. rather than orally passed on things or things in literature. Okay. In the process of moko, then were there sort of elements that came from? Um, astronomical observations in any way, like I'm thinking of the importance of, uh, I don't know how to quite to say the word, but no, sort of was family. Family. It was family. Family. It is but was family determined by identity and your relationship to society and your relatives, your ancestors. Okay. Identity in brief. That incorporates everything. Today you spoke about the cage in which New Zealand provincial sort of or colonial minds are entrapped. I'd like to expand on something about what that cage entails at some time. You talked about the local disease and its medicine. Well, it let me put it this way. Education already begins with the program of British history. It began, it began anything relevant uh, uh, relevant to people who look upon themselves as British first and foremost and that education has to fit people even of a very different ethnic background and uh, ethnic environment so there's never been a consideration the Pakeha believed that he could drag any group into the fold of its own ethnocentricity. And that in a world where people wander and travel more and more and increasingly influenced by other cultures surrounding them, geographically speaking, and the emigration that takes place, it stubbornly maintains uh, an education system that is not taking in account what is actually happening. You see. 
on what is. That New Zealand is a nation of two people. You know, that it should take account of that fact that there are two different cultures. Right. And the reality of it. It remained inflexible. It took the modern model from home and that had to be perpetuated in New Zealand in unchanged form as if there was no local reality at all. And that's the problem. You see, it remains in that sense parochial and provincial. It refuses to come in terms with, you can put it shortly, reality. The enormous influx of Polynesian islanders, apart from the Maori, has made it a different scene. But they do not think that it should have in any way repercussions on their education system. They don't have to change it. They have well, to take no account. Well, we were talking about the other day, Tony, is that an attitude that you could have as a Whakina, that, um, that the cultural future was shared 50-50% and didn't depend on 90% uh, Whakina and 10% non the attitude determines generally that New Zealand talents are paralyzed because so they cannot, cannot become, become cosmopolitan. cosmopolitan. You see. Because they have not been given the knack to assimilate beyond that framework. See, they're doomed to be parochial. What can be done about this parochialism? What is the potential and where do you think the future could lie? Um, particularly in the arts of man, mankind, and making children conscious of that art is a thing that has been practiced by many people as a language of its own. And Learning to understand other art languages, other manifestations of art that uh, go beyond the narrow Royal Academy orientation. Our culture. Not just the continent, but China, Japan, South America, you name it. Pacific. If the Maori problem, culturally speaking, is a Polynesian one. He is only part of the grander problems of the Polynesians in the whole basin of the Pacific. You see, so if problems are being solved here, they can benefit Polynesians elsewhere who suffer from, let me say, the same kind of ethnocentricity of missionaries or teachers that have been sent there to try and make more Englishmen. The experiment has to be in such a way that in New Zealand it can accommodate those things by actually working on such problems with that kind of consciousness. They're not only solving their own problem at home, but then they're helping to solve it all around, where our power or our authority once upon a time has demolished the culture mm. and replaced it with something that was had no basis in reality to their situation. Mm. Mm. They became have been made into what you call artificial people, artificial cultures. Mm. More and more divorced from who they are, what they are, and what their history is. The true history. So it's coming back down. Yeah, I don't coming. see that manifestation because they're not working on it. Mm. In my experience, this this is my, uh, and that is a very important one. I'd like to get across. I have observed what has happened in a hundred years in New Zealand, artistically speaking. And that is, you have in the one line the Pākehā art based on England, 
this was a very narrow orientation, not Europe as a whole, just England. What happened in London was of supreme artistic importance. And that London conditioning of New Zealand art made Parker art what it is, is parochial in a British sense. Now, that existed quite separately and had nothing whatsoever to do with whatever existed of the Maori culture. Maori culture was considered as something separate, mm. had nothing to do with New Zealand culture as such, because it was a culture that was obviously on the losing side that needed supervision to be transformed into the British model. So when there was a concern that they had to do something to retain the identity of Maori art and do something for Maori art, as they saw it was disintegrating fast. The dying race. The dying race. They had to make a gesture. They did not want to solve a problem. They just wanted to make a gesture. And since they considered that they were benevolence itself, they appointed a Pakeha director to the first Maori carving school in existence in New Zealand, and that was in Ohinamutu. Mm. This was Pakeha school teacher. And he was the kind of Pakeha school teacher who was not even an artist. He was not a man who was conversant with his own artistic heritage, mm. and even less with that of the Maori, but it qualified him to be the director and to be the guide of Maori art. Augustus Hamilton. Hamilton. Augustus it was Hamilton. And this man, in his innocence and his ignorance, could only recommend Maori, stick to your tradition, just copy meticulously and carefully, and don't do any questioning or thinking, or question the nature of art or artists. Just copy. And, and that was the case of death, <coughs> right from the start. It was a dissuasion of imagination. Yeah. But this, the denial of the creative force in all art, for any people. Uh -huh. Did it um, sort of freeze it in a sense too? Art was always done for s some or other reason, mm. or a combination of reasons. And for that reason, it had to be different from other pretexts for creating art. Ten years ago, twenty years ago. Hamilton said innovation is out.